So again, I want you all to give a warm welcome to Kristen Halliday, who has donated her time and evening in a July beautiful, we could be out on a yacht somewhere, right? She's here with us, um, and please give her a warm welcome, and then I'm going to go run and grab some food. Hey there. So um, Dan asked to come have me come and talk to you guys about going through our prequel process. And really, um, for those of you that are subs, know that um, I actually was at a conference last week, and they said that um, subcontractors fill out on an annual basis close to 300 prequels for different generals that they work with. So it's not something you're not familiar with. Um, Hoffman's not the only one that does it clearly. But um, just to maybe talk through why, what we're looking for when you're filling out your prequal, what's going to um, help you get into our system and, um, and, and get some opportunities coming your way. Because really, this is the first step um, to um, getting yourself as a company known to us and, and, and letting us know exactly what you do. So really, the prequal, like it says, it's really a, just a quick snapshot. Ours is basically five pages. Um, each GC's is different. I think Turner's is around seven, Skanska's is around the same as ours, um, and of the other GC's, um, those are the ones I kind of looked at when I was um, doing, looking through. So what we're looking to find, who's the point of contact in your company? Are you as the president, are you doing your own takeoffs or is your estimator? Who, who do we need to be in contact with to know, um, to give those opportunities to? Um, we also want to understand your capacity. Um, if you get into our system, you're going to get invited for, uh, for projects that start at 10 million all the way up to 300 million. And our, you know, if we know your capacity, we know if, if you're going to fit, because we don't want you to get over your skis, but we want to certainly let you know everything that we have available. Also, as a side note, if you have questions, feel free to raise your hand as we go along. Um, and then also, are you licensed in the state of where we are actually working? So those are some of the things that that come up because getting licensed as you guys are well aware is a process and if I send you an invite for something we have in California and you're not licensed to do there you know right you know you know right away and we have the ability within our system to differentiate as well so when you tell us the er areas of work if it's just King County if you do broader scope or you know all that kind of stuff we can differentiate so you're not getting bombarded with things where you don't you know you may not be interested in looking at um, many of our private owners and developers require us to prequal people before we even put them on a bid list. And so by completing the prequalification, you're already there and we can say, you know, we know these guys have capacity, we know these guys have the staff, we know that they have the support system in-house to be able to support your project. And so um, that's, that's one of the reasons why, why many generals do prequals as well. And then ultimately, our goal is to create, create a database of people we have relationships with of quality people that we can do work with on a regular basis. And I think that's the goal for every general. We really rely on really good subcontractors to be successful on our projects. And so as we go through the prequal, I'm going to kind of go through the sections a little bit of the Hoffman prequal. But again, it's not unlike anything you would see from any other, any other general contractor. Um, but as we go through it, just kind of talk to what we're looking for as you do it. So um, the Hoffman prequal specifically, um, just to get on our bid list, we don't require you to fill out the entire thing. We're looking for certain sections. Um, we are looking for sections. Um, it says at the top, uh, it's kind of a little bit blurry, but you only need one, two, three, four, and eight. And I'll talk through what those sections are. But And then if you're awarded work, we're going to look for the rest of the information, which includes more of your safety information, more of your experience. We do call your references. Um, your financials, we, we're going to want to look at those um, all the way through. So um, in sections one through three, we're just looking for general information about your company. We ask your business, your address, where you're located. Um, and the key thing on there is who your contact for bidding is, right? Who do you want us to, to send the invite to? If it's multiple people, you can give us multiple people. We have the ability to do that. We just need to know. And if you do multiple areas of work, if um, you do concrete or and you do flat work, but you have a different guy that does one and does the takeoff for the other, we can differentiate. We just need to know that information. Um, the second section is on licenses. I talked about that. We need to know where you're licensed to do business um, and that you're a viable contractor. The section three is about um, your organization itself. How is it set up? Who's your president? How long you've been in business? Um, 
why do we care about that? Why do, why do we care how long you've been in business? Because I, I think the longer you're in business shows that you're successful, right? And that, not that we don't look at a guy just starting out, because we certainly do, but, um, but that gives us a good, good snapshot really quick of, of, um, of your business and, and kind of who's in charge. And then in that same section, we ask um, if you're certified, if you're not certified, um, and what your, what your certifications are. And then uh, lastly, section four, is legal information. We want to make sure that you don't have any lawsuits or anything like that because we don't want to have any claims coming against us or anything like that, um, which, which can happen. On the next one, um, the next section is section five, which is the revenue. Um, that's where we understand your capacity. We want to know what your backlog is. Do you have, you know, a million dollars of worth of work coming up and we're looking to give you a $3 million contract, are you gonna be able to, to take on $3 million worth of work? Um, it gives us a good, it also lets us know if you have a good backlog, you've been successful in bidding. So you know what you're doing, right? You're looking at a job, you're being awarded work, and you're, and you're growing as a company. Um, and then within that, we ask what your biggest contracts are. Again, and then we let you tell us what's your preferred contract size, what's your sweet spot? You know, are you looking at a job for um, you want something for $100,000 or you think you could do a $3 million job? We, we want to know that about your company and how you feel you want to grow. Um, in section six, we talk, ask about your experience. So we want a list of your current projects and the co projects that you've completed. And um, again, just let's just know how you're successful. You're trying to unfortunately sell yourself to us as much as we have to sell ourselves to you, right? You want to do business with us, but we want to do business with you and we want to make sure that, that it's a good fit and that you um, can be successful for us. Um, section seven asks about your company size, how many employees you have, um, if you're union or non-union. Hoffman ourselves, we are not union. We have a union, we have some subsidiaries that are, so we can work with union or non, we don't really care, but we want to know what you are. Um, especially if, if something arises and we have to dual gates on our jobs or something like that, we, we do need to have that kind of record. And sometimes from time to time we have jobs where there's PLAs, I'll talk about that later, and we have, uh, we have projects that are funded by the Union Pension Fund sometimes in Oregon where we have, to, we have to use union contractors, so that helps us differentiate as well. We don't want to get you excited about a project and turn around and tell you, oh, by the way, you can't bid because you're not union, right? So we want to be able to have that information in our database. Am I going too fast? You guys good? Okay. This is um, the one thing, this is probably the one page that is the most important to me. I want to know what you do. I want to know what you want to be invited for. And I know it's really, um, you can look at that and you go, well, you know what, I don't want to miss an opportunity. And all of a sudden somebody comes a, becomes a general contractor and they click every box. <laughs> You're going to be super annoyed if you click every box. So. Just have faith that our system will only invite you for the work that you do. If you're a painter, you'll get invited when there's a painting bid. If you're a concrete guy, if you're a drywall guy, if you do asphalt, whatever it is, you're not gonna get an invitation on a project unless that piece of work is bidding. And a lot of times um, we have bid packages, as you know, where we phase the bid. So we may do the earthwork at first, and you may see you know, something's out, and you've been hearing about that project, and you see the drawings, and you're like, why didn't I get an invitation? Well, we're only bidding the earthwork, and you guys do drywall. When I have the drywall package ready, you're gonna get something from me and you're gonna see that, right? So that, this is key for me, and I wanna know if you furnish and install. We wanna know if you subcontract stuff, um, as there are opportunities there, especially if, if, if you're a prime, you're coming in, and it's something you don't do, it's an opportunity for a small business to come in and say, and I can say, you know what, these guys furnish structural steel, this guy over here does erection, let's team up. Let's talk about it. Let's, let's, get, let's get you guys teamed up. And that's, that's the key indicator for us. So um, this is a super important page for me, to get you guys in the right spot, get you in, invited for the right things um, so that you guys can be successful to, and learn about our projects as they come out. Next one. The next stuff is uh, uh, your safety. Obviously, we do not want to ever, we want to send people home to their families, and you guys do too. And so that's a good snapshot for us um, over, the la over the, we do a five year, I've seen some that do three, um, but we, look, we really look to make sure that safety is a core value for you like it is for Hoffman. 
Um, we want to make sure that people, like I said, go home to their families. Um, and then in Section 10, uh, there's a few things that we look for in references. Do you have access to capital? Um, that's going to be essential. A lot of our projects, um, you know, payments can come a little lagging and we want to make sure that you can fund, you know, if you need to draw on that, you can. We don't like to have to do that, but it does happen. Um, are you able to bond a project? In the state of Washington, all work over $300,000 has to be bonded. You have to provide a payment performance bond. That's not, um, that's part of the law. So. For GCCM, not for not for um, private jobs, and we'll talk a little bit about that. What we what creative things we can do there. Um, insurance um, is a big deal. Do you have you know Do you have it, <laughs> and and what what are your limits? And then ultimately, have you built good relationships with your vendors? Like I said, we do check your references. So if you've got an account with Par Lumber, we're going to make a call and make sure that you're current on your on your on your stuff. If you work regularly with Swinner, if you've done a job with with, um, I don't know, selling somebody, Turner, whoever, we're going to make a call of who you've put for your reference and hopefully they've got great things to say about you. And I get calls all the time on re for references from other generals as well. So um, we're, not, we're not the only ones checking them out. So just be mindful of who you put down there and, um, and uh, it's not just a, a body to fill. Phone calls do get made, so keep, keep that in mind. And then lastly, the big one is financials. And why we look at them, um, for the most part on private jobs, we would prefer not to bond somebody if we don't have to. But we need to understand the risk as we're going in. And so um, we review financials. What that includes is a, a balance sheet and a P&L for the end of the year. Um, if you have audited financials, we prefer that, but you don't have to. Um, and our CFO is the only one that looks at them. I don't even look at them. I have no idea what anybody's financials. Do. We have confidentiality agreements. We put everything in place so that you feel secure that what you're providing us is not being shared with others. It's not being shared with your competitors, obviously, and it doesn't even go out of one guy's thing. We can do go-to meetings. I mean, we've set up a way for you guys to feel comfortable giving us your financials so that we can make sure that uh, we're, we're mitigating the risks as we contract with you. Any questions on that? All right, that's our prequel in a nutshell. Um, and. Hopefully it's not too, <laughs> I, know, I know it takes time and we recognize that, but again, it gives us a good picture of, of what, um, what, you, what your company's like and, and what, um, why we would want to work with you. We're going to talk a little bit about it later, the kind of the extra steps, right, that, that the, the paper doesn't tell us about you, right, that, that um, as you're going to, I know, um, maybe James can talk how he got into Hoffman's, Hoffman's door. I mean, I, tell us kind of how that, you'd probably answer it better than I would on, on what it's like besides just the paperwork side of thing. I went in when I first got in business as a, a trainee on a project downtown Block 38. And uh, I went in to, to bid some work and I was, I was given an opportunity to uh, to do the work, even though I didn't have the, the bonding and all the other things that was in place. So it's a little bit different than Washington is in Oregon. But uh, I had a chance to go in and get mentored on doing some things that I wasn't skilled at, like Pandex. You know, I was a good flat work guy. And that was my, my mainstay, was flat work. But I was told that if I wanted to do the Pandex, that I could uh, get some help to figure it out. And, that's actually how I got in the door. Yeah. Second. Oh, go ahead. I don't want to take the floor. Okay. Well, um, Hoffman gave me my first opportunity, and the two biggest jobs that I'd ever done was with Hoffman. And what I've learned about Hoffman, those of you in the room that maybe the pre-qualification seems daunting here. Yeah. Well, Hoffman has a great administrative team. Uh, you're, there's a lot of different people that you talk to, like when you have to submit your insurance to a certain individual, that person will help you and walk you through what needs to be done. Um, with the safety, when you have to submit that, that the individual in Hoffman that handles the safety will walk you through and work with you and explain to you what it takes with it to fulfill what they're expecting. So I would encourage everyone in the room that don't be apprehensive because of this looks daunting. They will help you. 
And uh, as like my friend James here, then Hoffman also mentored me. Uh, Block 38 was where I started. And then from there I went on to H2PQ and did very well. And now I'm off to the races because of Hoffman. So I just want everybody to know, go for it. They'll work with you. Well, and I, I think part of that, just yeah. up on for a second, uh, it was, you know, there, there are pieces that we're bidding out that are, you know, bigger size packages. And some of those, uh, you know, we still have some, uh, requirements for uh, and goals for participation. And so we will try and match things up. We'll bring scopes that uh, make sense to match up with uh, maybe a prime tier sub with a sub tier sub so that we can help make those goals. And, you know, you know calling us and talking to us and talking to the right, uh, you know, the PM is a good way to uh, at least explore where those opportunities are and figure out what places we can plug you in at that may not be, you know, the straight over tackle, hey, I'm, I've got to bid this $5 million uh, piece of work. Maybe there's a spot that we can get you in that's 250000 that makes sense for you versus you know, jumping into the, uh, having to jump into the $5 million and bond the thing. So, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so, I'm exactly what Harold said about looking at someone uh, of our caliber. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's like these two gentlemen said that you guys work with them and help them with some of the issues that they may not have had going in. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of subcontractors, uh, one of the problems we have is, is, is lack of capital. So a lot of times we can't afford to bid these projects four or five times and not get any work mm -hmm. because we're depleting our capital just to bid this work. Mm -hmm. And so, going back to what Harold said, and hoping that if we bid some of these projects, so kind of link up with you guys, are you in a position to say if you bid it and your numbers are not exactly where we kind of work with you and kind of get the numbers together before we just throw that money down the drain for us to try to bid you guys a start a relationship? Yeah, I mean, it, it just depends on the scope and the, pro and the type of project. Yeah. If you're talking about yeah. a, a public bid uh, for our scope of work, that gets more challenging. You know, we have to kind of take the whatever the public contracting rules are as far as taking a bid. If it's talk, talking about scopes within, uh, say, the uh, general conditions or, uh, you know, things that we have a little more flexibility outside of the um, taking a little bit. Yeah, private sector projects. Yeah, private yeah, sector. We have, we have, a have, ton of, more, we have yeah. more opportunity to do that. So yeah. it just, yeah, obviously, depending on the project and where we're. So are you guys interested in that kind of relationship where, uh, like the gentleman said here, he's off and going. Now he's growing his company because you guys working with him. There's a lot of people that do it now who may come in at a certain level and say this is my capacity at this level. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, we can give you that capacity and we like to grow it. Are you guys interested in the sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Like Dave said, with the public stuff, we, we're a little bit limited in Washington, Oregon less so. But um, looking at areas of work um, that we can break apart, you know, like, um, one thing that we did HQP to uh, down at the Portland Airport, for example, that was a public job. But they um, they let us split floors, so we ended up um, giving people different floors to do, or you know, to to make sure that someone we weren't exceeding somebody's capacity, but we also weren't giving scopes so huge that you look at it and you go, "There's no way that I'm going to be able to do that." Not just from a um, from a staffing standpoint, but from a, a capital standpoint as well. If, with a smaller manageable contract, you can then grow your business and and you know, the next time you can take on a little bit more, right? That's the goal. One more thing, are yeah. you introducing folks like us to some of your relationships that can help us with our capital and body and insurance needs? We, there, there's quite a few that, that we can use. I, Oregon's got a, uh, quite a few. I'm sorry, I'm from Oregon, so I'm more familiar there. I'll get familiar here. But, but yeah, and you know, some of the things that we can do as well is um, whether it's, you know, uh, joint checks or figuring out a way to make sure that all of your guys get paid, but you're getting paid on kind of on a regular basis, we can work with you on that as well. So then you don't have to really tap into that capital either, if we can, if we can do that. Yeah, Danny. Danny. I just want to say one of the most important things in building a relationship is, is to be transparent. Um, when you, when you engage a Hoffman, Make sure that you let them know, well, this is, this is my capacity, this is how much money I have or don't have, and then they can work with you. It's, if you don't tell them and you get the job, well, uh, you're on the outside, oh, I need money. It's not a good situation, so transparency is very important. Um, 
when I did the Block 38, I started with two floors and ended up doing 20 floors. So and it's because Hoffman was willing to give me more work because they see the quality of that I did. So just want to encourage you all to, to be transparent and go for it. Don't be afraid. I'm willing. <laughs> I, I just, I'm sorry, I can't relate. Is yeah. Hoffman signatory? We're not. Our, the the uh, GCCM, the general contractor level is not. Our concrete divisions and our mechanical divisions are. But as a, so we can, we can. Projects that we're discussing tonight, are those under signatory? <laughs> There's some that have PLAs, but none are signatory. Yeah, Sound Transit has PLAs. Yeah. But well, they're all prevailing wage, though, right? They're all prevailing wage. They're all Correct. Yeah. We have what's called the subguard program where we, we buy a policy basically that covers uh, construction defects and pay, payment issues, um, but it's on our private stuff. And in the state of Washington, on their public stuff, we can't, right? But um, on our private stuff, we try to use subguard as much as possible, and that's why we review the financials and whatnot. So we make sure that yeah, you're good. On, on the public side, currently the, la the law doesn't allow us to use that. So, like Coleman or the South Transit projects, we have to uh, require bonds for the prime prime subcontract on the uh, on the private work. We're able to um, push that through subcard and not have to do that. But that's part of the reason we have the financial review as well, so we understand the risk we're taking. We're taking, we're taking essentially bonding on with that insurance. Do you, do you have more flexibility on design build jobs than you would do than you would have on? Um, Yes. yes, we do. We do. Yeah. Do you have any come across anything in the public sector? Yes. No. Not for the payment of a farmers. But like I said, your two projects, my two million dollars goes there. Then I can't do anything yeah. unless it's free. Anything in the market? Uh, Not unless the state of Washington so, changes. So yeah. the RCWs on GCCM say you have to require farms pay for bond for anything greater, any subcontract greater than $300,000, it's a prime subcontract for GCCM. So on these projects, anything that's prime, we don't have any choice. The, 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 the state requires us to do it. So We just need to talk to our legislature to get that up. Get that up. Yeah. Uh, have you guys uh, shown all financial services as well? Do we? Yes. To owners? To subs? Well? Yeah. So we public subcontract is private. private. That's right. Work. <laughs> you don't want me to work for you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I, I have a question. I heard Nathaniel said that he started with two floors and he ended up doing 20, which comes to my mind where can you, uh, like for example, my, my um, bond capacity right now is 750,000. Can you uh, make the project so I can have different 750,000 pieces so that that way I will be able to to um, bond the job if necessary? Is that something that is, is possible? Again, depends on the contract type and the type of, and the type of project. It's possible in certain amount, certain projects. In, uh, in others, it's not. If we have to go out and, you know, again, do a public bid for a scope of work, um, it uh, then we, we can't necessarily say here's this you well know, we could we could bid out two hundred thousand two hundred thousand two hundred thousand but it doesn't but we'd have to take a little bid on that if we were if again in a public GCM type stuff in a other delivery we have an opportunity to do what you're saying right? but it, again it just depends on the type of project you deliver. So it would be something that has to be worked with you guys specifically on a project, and it would be part of the conversation before submitting a bid. This is my capacity to bond, and yeah. you know that that, that, that would help. Uh, obviously, okay. a development package again for the work that we uh, uh, for four or five of the projects we're talking about today are. GCCM projects that we're bidding out as a uh, you know, package is that. And so those, we have less flexibility uh, because of how the RCW states and what we can do there. You know, on design build or private work, then we have a little bit more flexibility. We have a few projects that we're talking about that we have that flexibility to do that. Is, Daniel, is there anything that, 
can be done with the legislature to, to be a little more flexible with that? Well, I, I think actually we do have some opportunities to pitch some legislative priorities. However, we really have to kind of prioritize what they are. Um, right now, Oregon has a, a more um, flexible environment for us in the CMGC environment. And so we could, in fact, pitch something to CPAR that could, in fact, carry. Um, and, and there, there was, there has been some discussion about uh, allowing subguard uh, in lieu of bonding, which would, again, give us a lot more flexibility as far as that goes. Uh, but it hasn't uh, got anywhere yet with the legislature. So, so we probably need to take a group of people to the legislators. Well, I, I, number one, I think, that, uh, first of all, I'm definitely supportive of us moving bonding to the higher high list. Uh, Melody, who, who just stepped out, who works with WASDA, mm -hmm. is a staff member on the DBE advisory board. They're changing the makeup right now so it can be more action-oriented right. instead of uh, meeting-oriented. Uh, and so the hope is from that we can start pitching some, some very innovative programs. And so I have a program out of California mm -hmm. Um, that has been very successful. They've written uh, about $750 million uh, in bid bonds and about $300 million, a little over $300 million in performance and payment bonds uh, to DBEs and small businesses uh, like yours. Go ahead. Wouldn't that uh, allow them to see how Washington's trying to meet these goals that the governor wants if these legislators would um, lift some of these ICMS sanctions on us. You well, know, I, I so. think you're right. I think uh, a lot of these things that we're working on and that we feel are priorities do fall in line with not only the state, the city, the county, and even the port. Okay. So yes, there is some. Great quote. I sit on that board, so if you, if you give me what you want, I'll take the board. Okay. I sit on the seat board. That's why we help one another. Thank you. One more um, So a couple of other, uh, before we can let you see a project, which unfortunately we have to go through, is we do have private owners that require non-disclosure agreements. Um, they, they're usually written by them. Uh, Hoffman does a lot of work for private owners. Um, and so we will get you those non-disclosure agreements. Once we have those back, uh, it's usually just emailing you the, the link to the document. So it's, it's pretty, uh, but a lot of times I can't actually talk about the projects that we have. And so it's not because I am trying to be mean or rude or think that you shouldn't know about a project. It's, I, I honestly can't. <laughs> so you're welcome to call and ask me. I can either confirm or deny whether or not, <laughs> not we have it. But, but know that once you're in our system, um, that when the, those scopes of work go out for bid, you'll get, um, you'll get the NDA emailed your way. And if you're interested and get that back to us, we'll get you a copy of the, the drawings and then you can see who we're working for. Kristen, is there questions that we can ask <coughs> that won't compromise the non-disclosure? And I know there's some certain firms that may, you may have included in early pricing as, as an example, or maybe they submitted some pricing and you know, if, they, if they have, they've completed the NDA. Okay. So there's um, until, for budgeting purposes or whatever, what, if that's what you're talking about, if we've, if we've gone out and got some pricing on things, they have to complete the NDA even before they can see it to provide any kind of pricing to us. So if Chris, is, Chris who's our estimator, has gone out to get some pricing, he will have had me get the non-disclosure in place ahead of time. Does that answer any questions that anyone has? Um, another, we have a couple of owners that require background checks. That may uh, impact your um, labor force, um, given uh, some legalization of some things in the state of Washington and Oregon, um, that, or if there's, uh, they, they do check those and they are thorough. Um, when I filled my background check out for Boeing, they said, you better just tell us, because we're going to find out anyway. So. Um, 
I, I didn't have anything to put down, by the way, but uh, <laughs> but, our, but our PM did, and he put it down, and then he felt better about that. So it, you know, kids, kids are kids. What do you know, right? So, um, but they do it on everybody. So, and um, they're usually they pay for it, but if it's in our bidding documents, uh, you know, pay attention to it because there may be a cost to the extent that if you have somebody that doesn't have a clear background for the last three years, for some cases we've seen up to seven years depending on if they're in a secure perimeter. So um, kind of keep those, keep those things in mind. And I don't think that, it, um, that they'll deny anybody for certain things, but I think they just want to know about it. They don't want to find out about it later. And if something comes up, they, will, they, won't, they won't badge you. So there is that, yeah. Hoffman does drug testing. We do drug and alcohol testing on all of our projects. Um, when you come to our site, um, and Hoffman pays for that, but you do have to cover the time, right, for them, the hour or whatever it takes to get the drug testing. You drug testing me and I'm the owner. Well, there you go. You're still here, so you must have done fine. Good job. <laughs> uh, so our position is when you come to our job site, you're drug free, right? So when you test, you have to be drug free. Um, we don't want people building buildings that are, are compromised. And I, so far, there hasn't been a case tried to, that says that, well, we, sh that we're, we can't allow somebody. Yeah, go ahead, Dave. It, it, uh, it is a safety concern, right? Yeah. So if, uh, if someone is coming uh, to work Constantly. and is not in their full capacity, then it's not, uh, not safe for the workers around them. And so uh, our, and that is our position is that, and, and most uh, agencies and, all, and also the you know, federal government has basically said that's allowed uh, based on the, the work that you're doing. You can test for what, uh, uh, well, drugs and alcohol. <laughs> so regardless of whether it's legal or not, you can do it at your house, you can do it wherever. When you come to the job, you better be clean. That's mm -hmm. really the... Yeah. If a person has a couple of beers at home the night before, they can come to work no problem. But if you smoke a joint the night before, it's not going to fly. So the law hasn't really addressed that, even though they made it legal. But yeah, we it's have crazy. A, yeah, we have I don't smoke marijuana. But well, you passed, so you're good, yeah, right? So. <laughs> you're good. Yeah. That, that, that's right. Even in jail. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's our corporate policy. It's uh, and we have owners like Sound Transit and others that require us to uh, a uh, that's a federal. Um, requirement for federal funding. So all those things are um, things that are part of our program. And that's, I, I'm sorry, you can like it or you can not like it, but that's the rules. And that's, uh, if you want to work with us, that's going to be part of the rules. Yeah. Yeah, James. We've done a job on the A Street weekend to put an apartment structure at the Portland Airport. One of my guys walked up to me and asked me if a uh, bank robbery counts. <laughs> <laughs> it probably does. Right? Yeah. Yeah. No. yeah. Um, we're in SBI, uh, and we have we have young people in the back back there now who are going through pre apprenticeship programs in this building, and uh, we want to know if often would be able to take some of these young apprentices. Uh, on or work with some of the other subcontractors to fill these folks with some paying jobs. They've been going to these pre apprenticeship programs for six months with no pay. So we're hoping you know they're motivated. And we'd like to know if you guys would use your influence, if you guys could open some doors and sales or with some of these subcontractors. For sure. Yeah. And, and we definitely have brought on folks from SBI, or, and we can definitely put connections on it. So we don't, we don't hire electricians directly, but we have electrical subs that would. Uh, um, uh, definitely, uh, we can hook them up with and make sure we have to get the context. Did you hear that, Alicia? Pardon me? Well, you better pay attention. <laughs> uh, how could it just, they're going to consider taking some of your pre apprenticeship programs on with them, and if not, they're going to use their influence with some of the subcontractors. So, you need to hold them to the fire. So, so, so people that. So crafts that we directly hire are, you know, carpenters, uh, finishers, and laborers. That's uh, for the most part. Do you have any carpenters or finishers or laborers coming out of the pre-apprenticeship program? Uh, 
there it is right there. So tell him to quit being shy. So he needs to go up and get his car. <laughs> Don't be scared. <laughs> 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 Correct. So, so we have some direct, uh, Sound Transit has preferred entry, direct, direct tires road. Uh, once we start those projects, we can uh, bring people on. Yeah. There is another question uh, for you guys. Are you pre-apprentice or are you an apprentice and uh, approved by the state of Washington and have any apprentice number? But yes, their pre their pre apprenticeship training is recognized by the state of Washington. What rate they are going to get? Uh, apprentice rate they will get, or they will get uh, full prevailing wages? You, I can use. All you would be getting a first year apprentice if they got accepted uh, as a graduate of a pre apprenticeship. But do you usually have uh, the number uh, apprenticeship number from the state of Washington apprenticeship program? Well, that's the number that counts. Yes. yes. Well, that, that, that has to be if you're a signatory. No. We, 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 can, we can actually, I think we should, uh, at break, let, let's talk about that. I want to let Kristen get by, and I don't want to let the food get cold. I know you all are smelling it. It smells real good, I know. But we will get to that, Nadine, because okay. I, I want to get that answer for you. Um, I mentioned a little bit badging. Um, Boeing's probably the, uh, our Intel, when we do their jobs, they have their own, uh, if you're in a secure perimeter, that you have to badge to be able to get in and out. And it's just part of your orientation, get you badged um, and get in. But it, it uh, watch for that, and I guess in our RFPs as we put those out, if that's a requirement, it'll be noted in there that badging is required and what you need to do to make sure that all of your guys have time in your people. And then uh, the last one is we get your prequal related to safety. Um, it, it won't disqualify you, but we may put a corrective action plan in place, whether you need to have a full-time safety person, making sure that uh, they're paying attention to your guys, that you have somebody who's OSHA 30 trained. There's some, there's some uh, hoops that you may have to jump through if, you're, if you've had some safety issues, as that's uh, pretty important to offer. And then just real quickly, your awarded work, now what do I got to do, right? <laughs> and fortunately, uh, it's more paperwork. So um, just wanted to talk through a couple of things there. Um, if you want to hit the next one. We need to get um, acceptable insurance with limits. Well, we've probably gone through this on the pre qual process, but now when you have the contract, sometimes your sureties forget that this is what you told them you needed to have. And uh, we will work with you. We will talk to your surety. We will do whatever we need to do to make sure. And if for some reason we've had instances where your coverages that you have um, don't meet ours and it costs you a little bit of money, Hoffman will pay that difference if you to get what we need. If you have two million liability and we need three, it's going to cost you five hundred bucks to get it. We're going to pay you five hundred bucks to get your get get the limits that we require. Um, that's uh, we need to have the right stuff in place, and we're we're willing to work with you on that. So. Um, that shouldn't be an issue for you. On that topic, you know, it's, it's really good to know that they, ha they have that kind of uh, willingness <laughs> and flexibility. Sometimes there are certain uh, pieces, like say a waiver of subrogation. Mm -hmm. Certain carriers don't cover that. Um, and so in those circumstances... They we can recommend a new broker for you. <laughs> <laughs> we do that all the truth. Well, I know. <laughs> We can help. You, we can help you get with people that we know can get our coverages, and um, and work with you on that. That's that's. Um, and a lot of times we have CSIPs on our project too, where Hoffman's actually providing the, the general liability coverage on our private jobs, um, where we are, we are actually providing it. You you enroll in our program, and we provide the general liability coverage. You still we can't do workers comp in Washington because of L and I, but you should have that already set up with your licensing anyway, mm -hmm. and then the auto. Uh, Depending on whether you're a sole proprietor or if you are a business, you should have auto in place. So, but we can we can work with you on on whatever you need there. Gee, yeah. Let's assume that I got a job, mm -hmm. and I think I'm assuming really good. <laughs> so, I got my certificate of insurance to you guys. So I look really good. Um, the invoicing, uh, prevailing wage. I mean, I have done some jobs uh, for WashDOT recently. And uh, my payroll could be up to fifteen thousand dollars. 
in one week. Um, I just submitted a payment um, request, and I'm out 30 days. 45. 45. 40, well, I'm on the phone all the time. So um, can that be shortened in any way, or, or is paid when paid? And, and I, I actually, Daniel was with me when I said, no, this is not going to fly. You have to pay me. Because they put in the contract like 45 days, and I said, N.A. And I sent it back to them. And they didn't take it out. So now they are doing, you know, 30 days for me. Because, you know, by the time I have to pay all my prevailing wage, I have to pay my product to continue working, they, my producer doesn't want to wait 60 days unless I have very good reason, especially if I'm pulling a thousand tons of asphalt. They're looking at me and they are pressing their finger, otherwise they put me on cash. And I don't like that. Because then I have to go into my personal pocket and say, here, I have to put this money. And what I also um, recommend, if there's possibility of you guys, any of you guys getting um, line of credit, that you could borrow the money, pay it as soon as you get paid, and continue. But it's always challenging, especially when my, my mixed bill could be anywhere from 50, sometimes to $75,000 in, in one month um, for one of the, of the vendors that um, I have for asphalt. That's one. And I have probably four or five that I pull from. So when the money is out that long, it really can hurt a small business. So what is um, <coughs> that Hoffman does to make that a little better? Well, again, part of the, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll say again, part of it dep depends on the contract and what we have, you know, who would the owner and what we're doing. On, on public jobs, uh, you know, I'll, I'll speak to Sound Transit. They're very difficult. I mean, I, I, I get, uh, I'm, I'm lucky if I get paid within 45 days of when I submit an invoice. And so that means you're out, you know, 60, right? Six, and, and, you know, when we get paid, I guarantee you our checks are out uh, within within a day or two when we get paid. We know that has to get out. Uh, but you know, we're the same, you know, a bit of the same boat when they're not paying us. And unfortunately, you know, they, they have, uh, you know, you're looking at us as far as you're having the money. Well, we don't have the money until they have, you know, until they give us the money too. They're, they're the ones in control. So there, are, there are ways that we have done it on certain owners where uh, we've been able to do maybe you know a 15-day pay cycle or a uh, you know twice monthly pay draw, which you know gets us a little bit closer to that. Um, some private, bigger private owners we've been able to do that with, um, uh, but. It really depends on the situation, the contract, the, the, what, what, what we're being dealt with on the owner on our side, because we got to get the money too, uh, and we try and push that as fast as far as we can with those guys, because we understand the importance of getting people paid, um, and we're not going to hang anyone out. Uh, but you know, we, it, it just depends on what, when we're getting paid as well. What about the potential? Again, yeah, that's a, another one that is um, contract specific. Uh, most uh, owners are keeping five percent from us, and you know, some of the public statute says we have to keep five percent from you. The good thing, I'll, I'll, I'll flip around Sound Transit now. The, the Sound Transit, the federal and Pullman, the, the uh, any project that gets uh, federal highway dollars, we, uh, they aren't holding retention from us anymore. So. So that makes it easier for us on, on all, all accounts. So I have a contract with uh, King County Solarways. I get $556. They'll load it in and you'll attach your scholarly retention bond. And it's a half a million dollar contract. So you don't attach it. And regarding your first budget, I did like uh, Microsoft buildings. They charge 2% and they pay you 10 days. In private sector, uh, they do that. Right. Yeah, there's some there's some stuff we can play. Did they charge you two percent on the retention? No, 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 no. no. That, that was the answer to the question. The question, the answer to your question is all that I have the same frustration. 
This is the nasty business. Infrastructure, and you need to have hundreds of thousands of dollars if you want to do the program. Well. By cash flow, hundreds of thousands of dollars always in the market. You finish one job, by that time, you get paid, you spend more. So, so the retention bond is as if if there is an issue for some reason or if there is a defect. Basically, they've given you all your money, right? So there's no leverage there to fix something. If they call in that bond for whatever you, it covers the cost of the retention, and so there's a surety there. There's, it's an insurance policy basically to cover instead of instead of holding your retention, you've got the bond in place in lieu of that that they can call in if they need to. That's an option on some contracts. Yeah. It's not an option on all of them, but that, that's uh, an option. Yeah. yeah. Can, can we get his question in the back? Yeah. Okay. So I have a question. So um, every worker, are they licensed and um, 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 bonded that um, that work for you? Because I know, though, I've been on um, certain job sites, and then, like, I had to um, show proof of my um, my, my bond or insurance. So, like, I'm, I'm okay. Not, you're liable for me. Yeah. No. Not, not, not workers. Not individual workers. That's not. not we we not only look for stuff for companies. Businesses, Businesses do. But, 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 but the individual worker does not. Just be licensed to do it. Right. Electrician. Right. Right. Yeah. But you get that through your apprenticeship program, don't you? You go through and take your test and get your license. And stuff. Like, you, like you would for an engineer or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good. Yeah, Nathaniel. I don't know. I don't. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to quickly go through the rest of these. Um, so we talked about bonds already. Certain owners require the project labor agreement. Sound Transit's one of those. Um, it is their project labor agreement that everybody has to participate in. Um, again, that will be in the RFP, so you can price that accordingly. Um, as you're looking or ask questions, hopefully it's uh, clear, but based on what I've read, it might not be. <laughs> so ask, ask Kaufman, um, and we'll get your questions answered either through Sound Transit or from our experience on previous projects. We can, we can help you through that. Um, prevailing wage paperwork, you brought it up. It's a pain. Um, we have two people in our office that uh, are on the phone all day long with L&I. So we've built those relationships with them. Look to us as a resource. We're happy to walk you through. Make sure you're getting your intents filed. Make sure your uh, final lien releases at the end of the project, if there is retention, all those kinds of things. We just want to, we're there. We can be a resource for you to walk you through that process because we recognize that it's painful. Yeah? Do you guys have a checklist for your release of retention at the end of the project? We do. We do. That's great. Yeah. Yep. Do you also ask for your utilization reports and all that? I do no work utilization reports that come with projects. I mean, there's so many reports you have to fill out. It is. I think the, the state tracks them. I don't know that we we do, but we do have to get the paperwork at the end of the day. Yeah. They're trying to automate it as much as possible, but it's still we, we recognize that it's painful. That's, that, that, yeah. There, there, there is a diversity report. 
<laughs> depending on the owner. Okay. Depending on the owner, we have to comply with whatever they want us to provide. <coughs> Yeah, so for the most part, we, we track at a business level, and then if there's a workforce training and hiring program or apprenticeships, or as, as we're, you know, the city of Seattle is implementing their workforce training and hiring program that's similar to the city of Portland, um, we try to outline that again in the RFP, but there are, there are some reports that you're going to have to fill out on, um, you know, if, if on gender, on ethnicity, on um, veteran status, all that kind of stuff. Um, more and more, they, they want to make sure that that people are getting the opportunities and, and the only way they know is if, if people are reporting on them. And so that, tr that trickles down to you guys as well. But again, we have folks in our office that are happy to walk people through the forms to help you fill them out. We don't ever want this to, you guys to feel like you're out on an island and, and don't really, <laughs> don't have our support because we do have people there that are trained and that can, that can help out, so. Anyway, okay. Okay. yeah. So this would be an awesome time for folks. Yep. All right, ladies first. Vice President and Senior Project Manager on the Sound Transit projects. Um, he's going to talk about not only the projects going on with Sound Transit, he's also going to talk about some other projects. So make sure you take notes, you, uh, you stay alert, um, and let's try to save our questions for the tail end so we can get through the projects. All right, thank you. All right, well, thanks uh, again for coming out. Uh, I wanted to talk about some of the things that are coming up that uh, we really want to uh, get in front of you guys and have uh, opportunities to uh, work on. And so uh, first project I want to talk about is the one that's closest uh, uh, out for bid right now. It's uh, Sound Transit, Roosevelt Station. And currently we have uh, the packages for uh, most of the uh, structure work and the finished work that are out on the street right now. Uh, they were due, going to be due uh, next week. We pushed it out a week uh, on an addendum today, so uh, August 3rd. So it has anything from earthwork to shoring to masonry, structural steel, uh, got finishes, painting, uh, drywall, doors, overhead doors, uh, elevators, escalators, fire protection. I'm probably leaving out one or two, but uh, it has all, all those uh, very, very masonry, uh, various things in there. So uh, that's uh, uh, work that's out for bid now. The project starts in uh, February next year and runs through the middle of 2019. So uh, it's uh, the one that uh, is right in front of us. Additionally, there's a second bid package, go back one, that's for uh, concrete and uh, we're bidding that as our Hoffman Structures Group, and so we're actually looking for bids within the Hoffman Structures Group for uh, rebar and uh, finish work and uh, other different uh, miscellaneous stuff related to the concrete. So uh, pumping, uh, so uh, eco pans, other things that uh, uh, service the uh, the concrete side, so we're looking for uh, pricing for that, and that one's due on August 10th. So that's 728 has been extended to 83. Yep. Next project uh, is uh, Sound Transit University District Station. This uh, project is just uh, right in the middle of U District, next to the University of Washington Tower, old Safeco building, and it. Uh, is has the same scopes of work I just talked about for Roosevelt, uh, but it has about a six month lag period on it. I think November might be a little aggressive. I think it's probably closer to the end of the year or January before it bids. And it's gonna start work in July next year and run through uh, two, uh, 20, the year 2020. So uh, I said, very similar scopes to underground station. Uh, you know, four, four floors underground, and it has very similar scopes to the uh, Roosevelt Station. So uh, next project is a project we are, we are joint ventured with Kiewit on. It's called Sound Transit East Link E130. This project goes from uh, downtown, uh, the International District Station downtown, 
runs along the I-90 corridor. Uh, there's a station at uh, Rainier Avenue uh, between Rainier Avenue and 23rd Avenue. Uh, they call it the Judkins Park Station. And then there's a second station that's at uh, Mercer Island between uh, 77th Street and 80th on Mercer Island. And uh, the uh, light rail runs on the alignment of the express lanes uh, currently. And so uh, the express lanes are gonna go away to cars and buses starting uh, in uh, uh, middle of next year, middle of 2017. And so we'll start uh, putting rail on the uh, on those express lanes and on the bridge. So um, I mentioned we're a joint venture with Kiewit in that project. The current design is at 90% and we're gonna try to start bidding that uh, scopes of work uh, later in uh, the summer. So somewhere around uh, the 1st of September, we're hoping to get uh, start getting bid packages out. And there'll be a number of different types of scopes there. There's a, a bid package that's related to the uh, work that's converting the International District Station into um, ability to take uh, light rail out of that tunnel, out onto the tunnel, onto the uh, express lanes. And there are a number of scopes between rail, concrete demo, um, there's some uh, uh, flat work, some uh, uh, miscellaneous steel, various things to get that station ready. And then as it goes along the alignment, we have anything from you know, earthwork to uh, uh, shoring to everything, everything imaginable from you know, uh, mechanical, electrical, uh, masonry, steel, concrete, uh, and finish work uh, within the stations. The stations are not quite as uh, elaborate as the uh, underground stations, but they, have, they still have two or three stories of uh, head houses getting the uh, uh, pedestrians from the rail up to overpasses essentially that uh, are uh, the entrances to the to the stations. So uh, there's a lot of different scopes that are will come available, but those are starting. We'll bid in September, and that work starts around the middle of 2017, so middle of next year. E360 Sound Transit E360 is another job that we are uh, joint venture with Kiewit on. This one is a design build. And um, this is one that uh, is probably the longest project ever known to man before we've uh, actually got started. Uh, the, uh, we actually started pre-qual process on this uh, uh, over two years ago when we started with, uh, in, uh, this was Sound Transit. We turned in a proposal that we were successful on in uh, uh, March or April. Uh, I'm sorry, we turned it in in January. They notified us that we would be the successful proposer in, in April, and they finally just gave us notice to proceed uh, a day or two ago. So we're finally starting to get our feet around, our arms around where uh, we are on, on 360. So some of you have given us some pricing and bids on that. We're going to be uh, starting to be able to look at those and figure out where those uh, roll into our, um, our project. But we also have to start going actually going through the design on it too. So that project won't start uh, again until summer next year, but we'll start going through and finalizing design and trying to, to work with people at uh, where the uh, uh, submitted bids with us and understand the final design and get final pricing on that uh, over the next uh, next few months. So uh, again, that uh, is a good project, a different, little different delivery methods. So we have some different options on trying to uh, get some inclusion on that project, but uh, because it's design build. Oh, that one's kind of a funky one. But uh, this is uh, another project that we uh, are, we're joint ventured with, with Kiewit and Stacy Whitbeck on this particular job. And this one's out, out a little ways. Uh, it's a Linwood Link extension. It goes from Northgate uh, up to uh, essentially this piece, the south piece goes to about Mount Lake Terrace, just south of Mount Lake Terrace. And there's a north piece that we're uh, submitting on actually tomorrow. Hopefully uh, get that piece as well. So this piece is called L200. And uh, it ha essentially is four miles of both uh, elevated and at grade rail that takes you from Northgate along the east side of I-5 uh, until you get uh, up until uh, 185th Street. 
And that uh, project has uh, two stations and two parking garages currently on it. Um, and those are uh, the scopes that you know, Hoffman are, are, are really uh, focused on. And the, state, the Kiewit and Stacy folks are focused more on the uh, civil, the uh, sound, wall, sound and retaining walls, as well as the elevated guideway structures and the rail. So that project uh, said doesn't start until 2019. So we really aren't going to um, start bidding on that until 2018. So I'll come back, you know, a couple times, four or five times, and talk about that one before you kind of get bored of it, me talking about it before it actually gets out to bid. But it's on the radar for uh, backlog in a ways down the road. Another uh, project we have going on right now is the uh, Oak Harbor Clean Water Facility. It's essentially a wastewater treatment plant in the city of Oak Harbor, and that project uh, we have underway currently. Uh, we've excavated, insured, and started some of the deep uh, foundation work, but we have some bid packages for mechanical, electrical, uh, concrete, and then uh, whatever you want to call finishes at a treatment plant, which uh, are usually pretty rudimentary, but. Uh, <laughs> But this one has, you know, a few nice, uh, nice. El admin there's a nice admin, yeah, nice, nice admin building, and some nice. Uh, uh, there's some nice elements because it's it's actually right in the uh, the middle of the uh, Oak Harbor town, right on their waterfront. So they've they've done some nice treatment to that. So there will be some finished bid packages as well that go along with that. Uh, anyone that wants to. Uh, I, I will tell you, it's it's right up on the water. It's kind of a nice place to work. It's a little bit tough to get to, but if you're working up there, can't beat working up there. I've uh, taken a few trips just to uh, check out the place. And Can you fish? You could. You could. I used to crab up there a little bit too, but... Uh, it's a brand new facility? It, it's, well, they have an existing facility there that is not operational. Right now, they essentially, it's not, it's not much, it's most, mostly a headworks um, that that they've uh, essentially moth uh, mothballed, and they're sending their uh, wastewater to the Navy station right now. And so, instead of, so this will allow them to treat their water themselves. So. Uh, is, it, uh, is it so far? You can't say in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, here's uh, one of the project projects we have. Um, this is called uh, 2208 uh, uh, and it's a uh, 42 uh, eighth Avenue or 2202 eighth Avenue it's a uh, 42 story 40 story apartment complex uh, uh, downtown just uh, just off of Westlake uh, on eighth uh, and Blan eighth and Blanchard and so that's a project that we just have coming out of the ground right now it's uh, uh, the holes dug the uh, first mat slabs in and they're working on the concrete core and so we have some uh, finishes they're going to bid on this project that will uh, bid out uh, in uh, October this year so we do have an art museum that's going over uh, in uh, Pullman uh, it's uh, a smaller a smaller project it's about uh, a, a nine million dollar project and it uh, is a design build uh, we're just starting in that range right now and uh, It'll bid uh, in 2017, just a project we've been awarded recently. So, but it's on the radar. So, people that want to go over and work in Pullman, I don't know why you'd ever want to do that. But uh, <laughs> we 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 take we take all kinds. <laughs> that's uh, is that it. Yep. All right. So that uh, that covers most of the uh, uh, things that we got upcoming for uh, for bids. You know, I want to just encourage you that uh, there's a few thing, few ways to uh, find out about uh, projects and things that are coming up and keep in touch with us. You know, I think the first is, uh, you know, keeping in touch with, you know, Kristen or myself or Andrew on the projects that we're um, uh, managing. That's a good way to understand, you know, timing on things changes. And it's, it's really a dynamic market you know when I say you know things might bid in October you know we could get a design change that uh, you know pushes it out to December or that sort of thing so you know keeping in touch with us we can you know give you some heads up hey this thing we thought it was here it's it's, it's actually coming out here and um, beyond that you know we try and uh, um, if you get on our prequel Kristen will issue out uh, smart bid invitations once uh, bid packages to get out from our uh, from our our system 
And additionally, we show them on the web on our website. If you're just uh, cruising around our on our website and the subcontractors page, there's a tab that uh, lists all the projects that are out to bid right now, and and even some of the ones that are upcoming. And you get a link to the drawings a lot of times on there, a link to the uh, our, our our folder that has the the drawings or the plans on on just off our website. So we try and make it as easy as possible to obtain the information. And once you get it, you know, feel free. We'd love to. If you have questions or need to figure out how to, you know, some of these projects, uh, you know, uh, the C Sound Transit E130 project, I have uh, 15 volumes of drawings that are probably, you know, uh, if you stack one on a plant uh, table or that that thick, and it's tough to weed through, and I and we get that. So if you have questions when you, if you see a bid package that comes out, say, hey, where do I find this stuff? It, uh, you know, I, we, unfortunately, I've had to go, I've had to dig through every one of those drawings, so I know where stuff's at. I don't want you to have to go through the same pain and suffering. If you want to, um, you know, get get some information about, you know, where where do I look for that? You know, uh, just uh, call me, email me. I'd love to help walk you through there and figure out how to get uh, how you participate in those things. And so, our our team will be uh, very very willing to do the same. Um, and you know, if there's uh, packages that out there that are 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 too big, that yeah, man, that thing looks like it's uh, you know five million dollars. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to make make that. You know, we're willing to you know hook you up with uh, a prime sub to say, hey, there's a scope of work here that we can make sense to get you get you participated in. But you just need to know that you're interested, and we can try and make that connection for you and get you get you working. So that's you know part of the part of the deal is just trying to find ways to get you opportunities. So, Eugene. They vary. I mean, it depends on the project, but I can tell you the, um, I can get a couple, I can name off the top of my head. You know, the, uh, the Sound Transit, Roosevelt, and uh, U-District Station are 10% small business, 8% DBE. On the um, E-130, I think it's, uh, don't quote me, it's eight, I think it's 8% small business, 5% DBE. On um, 360, I think it was more. E360, I think it was in the 10% range. I, I, I don't, yeah, yeah. So, I, and all of them have, all of them are a little bit different, you know, uh, depending on the funding, funding source and and the owner. You know, they all have a little bit different goals. But um, regardless of that, we're always trying to get, you know, participation on any of our projects, regardless of whether the owner has a, you know, a 2% goal or a 10% goal. We want to make sure that we have people that have opportunities to be on it. I'll follow up with you, Gene, with all the projects. Correct. Correct. Yeah, I mean, we, we don't uh, don't want to uh, have any project where we don't have a, a way to get someone participating in the project. So we, we definitely have ways to, to and have goals to make internally to make that happen. We have any applicants that require money to visit all the other projects? No. The uh, again, it just depends on the agency, right? The the Sound Transit they they do S, S and DBE. The uh, ferries, it's just DBE. You know, King County does the SCS. You know, sometimes it's the the Boston Sound Transit and the E County. Yeah, you know, and SSCS is not a goal. Is that the requirement? Not Sound Transit. Yeah. King King County has is the one that did SCS. It started the SCS. No, it's not. Again, it de it it it, it uh, depends on the agency, right? SCS and 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 SCS that the county King County does is mandatory because it's not a, uh, a race-based decision uh, for for the uh, selection. The DBE and SBE goals that are federally mandated are goals, um, not they can't be requirements because of the I two hundred piece of it, but. Regardless of that, you know, our we're going to meet those on our Sound Transit U two fifty job. We had a, a goals of eight and six, and we're at thirteen and ten. So we're 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 committed to doing whatever we can to in, in, include and make sure people have opportunity. Jordan, I have a question about 
I'm very pleased, number one, that you all made time to be here. I, I spent a lot of time thanking all these other folks that are here, but really, honestly, I'm very glad that you're here. You really made my day. I know it wasn't easy for some of you, um, many of you, and I just want you to know how much I appreciate it. Um, I wanted to also make sure that, you know, there's a lot of good messages and information that was presented today. Um, if you felt like you didn't get all the information written down, you, sh you can feel wonderful that these wonderful people over here are capturing this footage. It will be edited and dropped on the Hoffman EIW Contractor University uh, YouTube station. Um, if you don't have uh, that information, just feel free to go to YouTube and uh, you can do that or shoot me an email and I'll make sure it gets to you. Um, our goal is to make sure that you're engaged in these projects but are actually included in these projects because my, my grade is really based on performance. I'm a result-driven consultant and so if we don't have results on these projects, they're going to go find somebody else, right? So we don't want that to happen. So we want to make, right? Right? Yeah, yeah, I spent a lot of money on this food, man. That's right. We want to make sure that whatever matches that are created are profitable. And, and that is, you know, that's why we're here. That's why the Institute was created. So if you find some areas within your business that may need some refinement, we have a whole lot of uh, team members here that would love to embrace you. Yes, there is a small uh, fee to be a member of EIW, but I can tell you, you're getting a lot for it. Um, and we're real thankful that you are expressing interest. Another thing is some of these projects are pretty huge. I mean, we're talking about a half a billion to a billion dollars worth of work over the next, you know, three to five years. That's a lot of work. It's probably more. And, and so if we want to go after that kind of work, we need to think outside the box. And it may be too big for your umbrella, but look how many umbrellas we have in here. Um, so I want you to be strategic and innovative and come to us and we will help align you with those folks that could help uh, expand your capacity. I want to have $100 million uh, firms that are participating that came from this effort. I said it out loud, it's going to be on YouTube, so that means it's going to happen. Help me make it happen. Thank you very much, I'll see you next time. Oh, go ahead, Gene. You know, and I think I, I, I'm glad you brought that up because actually Nadim had a question earlier that I don't know that we answered also. Yeah, and so Nadim's question was obviously he's looking for labor force. And some of you are all looking at the future and thinking, hey, man, it's thinning out. You know, too many gray hairs out here. We need to get some some young folks out here. And so what you need to think about is if you want to leverage the pre-apprenticeship organizations and you want to leverage that as a tool or an instrument on some of these projects that uh, Hoffman is participating on, understand that a lot of these projects have a PLA or a CWA. And so if your firm is not signatory, then the expectation is for that project, you would sign a project labor agreement just for that project. And then what you would need to do on the other side, if we had pre-apprentices coming from SVI, Tarot, a new PACE, whatever the programs are, um, what they would need to do is make sure that their students are um, eligible for the, the union uh, apprenticeship program. And then, in fact, you could, in fact, have a union apprentice on your project being a non-union you know, firm. But on that project, you're classified kind of as a union because you would have to adhere to whatever their agreement is. And like the CWA, you get one of your guys, one of theirs, one of yours, one of, or, you know, and so you got to rotate. And so it's very specific depending on what your trade is. Enid.
that sure. dying uh, breed that right. are needed because it's impossible for us to find, you know, even the tinctures are very difficult to get in sure. the summer months. Well, so, Sure. And these guys, I mean, they work hard, so they find it kind of relaxing to do whatever they do. I don't know. I don't know exactly what they do, but it, it is very tough. It is very tough because um, the, the labor is not there. Yeah. The operator nor the tincture. It's just very, very competitive. Well, I can tell you, you know, if you mentioned a whole bunch of things. <laughs> uh, I can tell you on the labor force piece, we have to do a better job. We, all of us, have to do a better job of empowering people like Amisha. And how we empower her is to, to notify her of those opportunities that are available on these projects. That's why we're doing this, number one. And then we got to also say, hey, our companies, we need folks in these areas. And then just for a word of advice, as we are, a lot of us are working in the private sector and the public sector, and they have different rules. And I'm not encouraging or discouraging. I'm just going to say neutral because that's the state we live in, okay? I'm not getting political today. Um, but you could, in fact, have two different databases in your company. You have folks that are accredited, maybe have OSHA 30. Uh, maybe, you know, they've... Uh, they have more experience and supervision. Maybe they can, they understand prevailing wage. And so you can, in fact, you know, have multiple, you know, crews that you are deploying on different projects. And certain projects have different requirements. So you just, you, you, you want to make sure that you're thinking about that. And obviously in some of these projects, uh, folks that have uh, uh, criminal records, there are opportunities for them. And, and Melody, is one of the the big champions and advocates around that and so we're trying to be creative and and you have been invited to a meeting later uh, that will involve some of that creativity and how we can figure out what to do and some of these kids that are doing drugs they may not necessarily be able to participate on their on 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 these projects However, there may be other support activities that they could do. I mean, kids that are, that are medicating themselves, you know, I'm not going to be judging them. And, you know, and I don't think we should either. And the industry needs to be able to understand that. And so what I'm trying to do with EIW is to be able to help us develop skills, help us polish our skills up, but also introduce those other supporting skills that are important on these projects, the project administration, the project management, the scheduling, the invoicing, the submittals, all that process, RFIs, change orders, there's so much, and, and you never have to get a tool belt on to do those work. Some of that stuff you can do from home if you're disabled. So to me, the industry needs to be innovative. We have a CPAR member here who, who really has embraced our businesses and donates a lot of time uh, trying to mentor us. So I would encourage us all to, to reach out to the people in this room today and make sure you make the most of it.